Hello and welcome everyone to the fifth edition of the IFAD Innovation Talks, focusing today on how to deliver agile and sustainable procurement through innovative approaches. I am pleased to welcome distinguished world experts in procurement from IFAD, the World Bank, Advocate Firman Runeland, Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Inter Development Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Before we start, I would like to navigate you through so, some quick tips to help us run in a smooth and enjoyable event. Please use the chat box to communicate with panelists and attendees and to let us know where you're joining us from. This option will only be available at the beginning of this event to avoid interrupting our speakers. Also, please use the Q&A box to post any questions that you might have, and remember to upvote your favorite questions by clicking on the thumbs up icon on the Q&A box to help us prioritizing which questions to answer first. This is a reminder that today's event is being recorded. By joining the event, you are agreeing to, re to the recording taking place. We have a really tight agenda today and a starting lineup of speakers to whom due to time, I won't be able to make any justice. So this is an invitation to visit our event page to check the speaker profiles and the event concept note and agenda. John is sharing the link with you right now. Without much further ado, I would like to welcome IFAD's director of the Operational Policy and Results Division, Thomas Eriksson, for the opening remark. remarks. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. And good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening. And huge thanks to all of you for joining us today for this very interesting conversation on delivering agile, sustainable procurement through innovative approaches. Uh, to start, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, very, very much for accepting IFAD's invitation to join today. Um, in IFAD, if I may dwell on that for a few seconds, we have gone through a wide ranging reforms on how we go about project procurement. No stone has been left unturned. We, has re we have reworked everything, starting from our policy framework and followed through across all areas of implementation, including how we engage and support borrowers. This is all very much part of a journey to ensure that IFAD practices meet all the international standards, as well as being fit for purpose. We did this because procurement is the key process that links financing to the outputs and outcomes of a project. Procurement plays a key role, both in terms of introducing and promoting good standards and transparency, sustainability and safeguards, and is also essential to delivery of all the development results on the ground. As such, we need to be flexible. We need to be agile in how we deliver procurement solutions. This is not always easy, especially when you follow strict and rigorous procurement frameworks imposed either by national law, by donors, or perhaps also by international financial institutions. And this tension is exactly what we want to explore today. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and all the learning that I will personally take away from it. Again, Thanks for joining. And with this, I hand over back to Gladys. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and thank you also for emphasizing the importance of uh, procurement, especially agile and sustainable procurement, uh, procurement for innovation. So now I am pleased to welcome Enzo De Laurentiis, a Chief Procurement Officer in the Operations, Policy and Country Services Vice President at the World Bank. Enzo brings a wealth of experience in procurement at the World Bank as a consultant to several multilateral development banks and also as a professor at American University. And so over to you. Thank you very much, Gladys. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about innovation, in particular about sustainable procurement, a conversation that necessarily needs to start with the role of government uh, with respect to procurement, modern government, um, which is critical to provide a stewardship of limited public resources, um, to deliver quality uh, public services with value for money and integrity to citizens and promote uh, growth and investment, which is uh, sustainable growth. Uh, so this, of course, evolution is mirrored by the modernization of the function at the multilateral development bank. Um, as Thomas just was saying, 
uh, where procurement is key to deliver uh, sustainable development results, not only in, um, um, you know, uh, in economic terms, I mean, maximizing value for money, but also by protecting the environment and the communities that we serve. So in public administration, procurement is essentially both a, a key um, service function uh, to deliver you know, projects and, and, and procure for, for recurring needs, but also strategic policy tools that can help achieve a broad range of uh, social and economic uh, welfare objectives. So at the core of this is innovation, because clearly innovative solutions to public service needs are instrumental to deliver better services with longer term uh, value for money. So this can be an important driver of resource efficiency, sustainable consumption, the move to a circular economy and responsible industry practice, which is critical. So it's key to implement every aspect of sustainable infrastructure, for example, uh, from smart government uh, to smart transportation, to smart buildings, smart energy and water, makes very good financial sense. So that's one of the way why uh, partnering also with the market is critical because uh, help reduce total operating costs, uh, um, boost investment, uh, also labor markets help create green jobs, and can influence a significant um, you know, investments in industry, in new skills, new technology, new equipment. In fact, uh, most uh, um, uh, governments, the OECD also consider now procurement as a stronger driver of innovation in markets than R&D subsidies. Um, so this requires a flexible approach, but also systematic. And, and really uh, evidence-based uh, and sustained uh, with uh, you know, a significant uh, data analytics. Um, so uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the need to engage very early on with markets, uh, to do very significant upfront planning, uh, to test new ideas, uh, discuss risk with the market, provide visibility next step, and receive feedback from the market that is critical to improve, continues to improve the, pro the processes. It is important to take, a, um, as we said before, a fit for purpose approach where uh, procurement strategies are uh, tailored to the specific operating environment, taking into account all the, the risk and opportunities in the market, in the supply chain, uh, in, the, in the particular uh, community and the stakeholder uh, experiences. Uh, of course, it also requires a whole range of new uh, approaches that were not used as much before. They're not, they're not totally new, but uh, they are certainly more recent in, in our organization, but, and they are critical to deliver these objectives. Uh, we're talking about using uh, more collaborative, more negotiated approaches is rated criteria and more sophisticated use of life cycle costs, value engineering to encourage suppliers to continually identify better, easier ways, less costly, lower risk way to deliver contracts. So this really requires at the very beginning to uh, look at all identified environmental and social risk, incorporate them into the procurement process, design KPI to manage contract effectively, and continue to you know, incentivize the right companies to participate, companies that are committed to sustain sustainable uh, practices. Of course, also enforce the contracts and apply, um, and apply contractual obligation um, and, and, uh, and penalties. So uh, quality infrastructure investment uh, in, involve uh, strategic procurement consideration from the very beginning, from upstream uh, public sector uh, management uh, down to, to the supply chain. Um, and includes uh, uh, socially uh, sustainable uh, practices that need to be incorporated into the um, uh, the, the proposals, so, so the, 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 the participants need to, to include uh, environmental and social management plans, uh, includes uh, managing proactively and preventing uh, gender-based uh, violence uh, or um, other uh, um, practice, labor practices like uh, um, uh, preventing uh, child labor and so forth. And of course, this doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's an evolution that uh, is a major change management process, a culture that encourages intelligence risk-taking and recognizing rewards innovation and has to become part of, a key of the DNA of the, of the procurement organization. Uh, so it involves really the ability to exercise judgment, making decision that involves multiple trade-offs. Human capital is critical for innovation, so it is critical to ensure that procurement staff become change agents in the organization. So um, I will stop here, I have reached my time, but uh, just to say that uh, the, the, the uh, reform that, that leads to these results includes in extensive outreach and consultation, leveraging all change agents and uh, uh, really um, uh, identify uh, what drives the, the stakeholders so they all become owners of the reform and, and agents of change. So thank you very much and I look forward to the question. Thank you, Ansus. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, you know, just I would just like to highlight two things that you said about the systematization of procurement and uh, bring making it more agile, but at the same time making sure that you're still monitoring those key performance indicators and the balance between that and uh, the enforcement of contracts is something that is uh, is key to achieve so that we are innovating but also making sure that um, we are enforcing the the principles of our our organizations. Now I am pleased to welcome our panel of speakers, Ion Jackhall, Director of Procurement at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Shirley Maud Gale, Senior Procurement Specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank, Priscilla Torres, uh, Lead Procurement Advisor, Operational Policy and Resources Division at IFAD, Jeffrey Taylor, Director of Procurement, Division One, Procurement Portfolio and Financial Management Department at the Asian Development Bank, and Aisha Nadar, Senior Procurement Specialist at Advocat Firman Runeland. I would like to start by asking our panelists, which preconditions need to be in place to support innovation through procurement? And um, Jack, would you like to take that question? Thank you very much. Um... Yes, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, enabling environment, uh, but uh, rather from the point of view of uh, the kind of issues that we have as uh, development banks. Uh, and I think uh, first and foremost, I really do want to emphasize that we are talking about is innovation from the perspective of what do development banks do, and not from the perspective of, let's say, EU or NASA or the pharmaceutical industry. I think that is uh, two very different sort of uh, uh, let's say, uh, backgrounds uh, or, or environment. Uh, the second, I, I would like to define procurement of innovation as procurement of a promise, meaning that you know what you would like to have, but you do not know if it can be done or if the product even exist. Yeah. And I think a good example we have seen uh, during last year, which is the COVID vaccine, which obviously didn't exist in the beginning of the pandemic, but uh, uh, we are all extremely happy that it does now. Yeah. Another way of describing uh, it is uh, what to buy without necessarily describing the details. Yeah. And I think this is important for what I'm going to say later. Yeah. It can also, however, be uh, an improvement of a function. It doesn't necessarily have to be all innovation, let's say, in terms of new, new uh, uh, let's say, goods or et cetera. You know. Now, thirdly, um, I would like to, to make a point out that development banks are primarily financing public sector projects or programs in traditional sectors with traditional objectives in a development environment. And I think that is very important for the, let's say, approach that, that we are taking. And therefore, uh, we are probably not the ones that are the spearheaders of, uh, of procurement or of innovation. But I do believe that we are good in innovation of procurement. And I believe other speakers will uh, allude to this also. Yeah? Because uh, it's very clear that over the years we have been driving development on issues such as uh, inte integrity, uh, health and safety, or environmental considerations, as well as e-procurement. And I think we have done a very good job in that. And I am, uh, let's say, I know that uh, on issues such as, let's say, uh, environmental considerations, we have actually been uh, way ahead of other very developed countries or institutions as a group. You know. um, in EBRD in particular, European Bank for Reconstruction Development, we are very actively promoting multi-stage tenders, which is one of, to me, preconditions to achieve sort of uh, uh, innovation in the objectives of what needs to be procured. And the, this uh, multi-stage, uh, uh, let's say, tendering approach allows technical and commercial dialogue before the final tender and before money is on the table. We have also developed an e-procurement platform that can accommodate the whole tender process. And that is for goods, works, and consultancy services. And this is being used by our clients. And I think that this is innovation of procurement. Uh, I know obviously that we have e-procurement platforms all over the world, but I think that this is a, a, an extremely good example of how the bank can actually drive this in, in a practical way. However, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the enabling environment. And uh, one thing is for sure that 
as development banks, we are predominantly not working in an environment which is particularly uh, enabling for procurement of innovation. No? And I am excusing myself to anyone who thinks the opposite, because you are coming from a country which is uh, a developing country and have a very good enabling environment. I'm going to generalize very much. So I know that in some countries uh, it is not the, the case uh, that I'm describing now. And I'm going to try to do this quickly. To start with, um, the way that the law is interpre interpreted in many of our countries is that what is not expressively permitted is not allowed. And this obviously does not help you when you want to come up with new uh, solutions, you know. And this is a bit of a, both a legal issue, but it's also a, a, a sort of a culture issue. Another thing is that uh, pres prescriptive procurement is often the norm and even part of the law uh, rather than uh, functional requirements. So. We also see that uh, we have a very often a tick box approach to procurement rather than seeing it as a strategic tool for development. Yeah. Corruption is an issue. Iterative procurement processes, therefore, is uh, uh, problematic. Yeah. Upfront cost may be high without a guarantee for success. And I'm sorry, I'm out of time, so I'm going to say just that procurement laws are based on selection of lowest cost tender, which is a problem. Budgets are made on an early, uh, uh, let's say, a yearly, life, uh, yearly cycle, making life cycle cost analysis difficult. And last, project preparation and market analysis are often uh, not adhered to in the way it should. Sorry for taking a little bit more time. Thank you. Jack, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, your points and I hope that people are starting to write some questions in the Q&A box because I myself would have a couple. I think that uh, your emphasis on making sure that we use procurement as a strategic tool is, is a key one, but your mentioning of uh, living outside of the law sometimes when you need to be innovative but not being able to do so because of the uh, cultural or uh, or the legal barriers in a country that's uh, that's something that we need to consider and uh, and think about uh, when we talk about uh, introducing innovation in uh, some of the programs and projects of our agencies so i would like now to ask uh, shirley from uh, the inter-american development bank to share with us what can innovative procurement solutions such as promoting or piloting startups research or, or crowdsourcing deliver shirley Thank you very much, Gladys, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. At the IDB, we have seen that these non-traditional approaches that you mentioned can really open up a world of solutions. And if you think about it, in the, in the conventional demand-driven procurement, as, as, as Jack described before, we, we approach the market and we say that we want a product or service and we describe what this, the criteria that this product or service should meet. But this is often based on our own narrow understanding of the problem and what it will take to solve. It's also based on what we know already exists. But what about the things that we don't know about or the solution that our problem might even cause to be created? And, and this is how new approaches such as crowdsourcing can serve to discover a much wider range of innovative options than the standard traditional procurement approaches can yield. At IDB, we have the IDB Lab, which is our innovation eco lab of sorts, where we are able to go more nimbly through the innovation process of problem identification, solution discovery, matchmaking, piloting, and scaling. And we are able to pilot new concepts and support borrowers in working with a variety of solutions providers using grant funding. IDB Lab has held several pitch day events and challenges in various sectors, education, tourism, social protection. For example, the Beyond Tourism Challenge, the Orange Innovation Challenge they did last year. But a very, very interesting one that I want to highlight is the, the Better Together Challenge that was done in collaboration with USAID to crowdsource and scale solutions 
to support Venezuelan migrants and the host communities that have been impacted by the massive inflow of these Venezuelan citizens. The challenge was a global outreach and it involved multiple stages with various criteria and rounds of judging. And at a certain point, proposals were even able to form coalitions. It, it received overwhelming support, more than 1,100 proposals. And in the end, um, there were 32 innovations that are now being implemented in 10 countries of the region where Venezuelans have relocated. So think about it. I mean, which, which um, expression of interest, RFI process, would be able to give you 1100 proposals and who would be able to evaluate all those. So, so this is the way in which we can be a lot more flexible using these, these methods and we can yield a lot more. We've heard from Jack that flexibility is key. We also heard that from Enzo, the enabling environment. And so the important lesson for us is that we have to, uh, flexibility is a key part of the enabling environment. That, will foster and support innovation. Some of our borrowers were saying to us, they needed us to help them to work around the limitations of their own procurement frameworks. That we've, we've heard Jack speak about that. For example, they might want to hire a, a small startup that they discovered through a pitch event, but they were not able to do it because their procurement rules did not permit this kind of thing. We know as a financier, our policies supersede the national procurement laws. In, in the projects we finance, but we couldn't be useful to these clients if our own procurement framework were equally as rigid and not in step with the time. So last year, we launched new procurement policies and we included among those policies methods like innovation partnership, competitive dialogue, which is a, a lot more flexible, innovation partnership, the, contracting agency can work with a solutions provider and invest in, in the promise, as, as Jack said. But we also realize that we can have these methods and still not be flexible enough in their application. We, we are, we're not going to be able to deliver all the support we want to for innovation through IDB Lab. We wouldn't achieve the scale, not if the bank aims to become the open innovation broker and partner for the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. So now in the wider institution, we are working to mainstream the open innovation methodology into the general project development, project design process, and to ensure that our procurement framework is agile enough as a vehicle for de delivering innovation of whatever form to our clients, bearing in mind that innovation is not just about technology, but it's about new novel and creative ways of solving longstanding and evolving problems. So I think I have maybe, yes, my time is up. I'll, I'll stop there and leave some for the question and answer. Thank you. Shirley, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really happy that you mentioned uh, the Inter-American Development Bank Innovation Lab. That's uh, that's one of our main partners. And you mentioned before um, scalability. And I think that uh, we will be discussing that later on with Aisha. But I think that a key point in what you were mentioning is how for scalability, we do need to have those uh, that systematization in place, but at the same time, flexibility, agility, and uh, to make sure that um, uh, we are giving the space uh, for innovation to happen. So with that, I would like to move on to Priscilla, and I would like to ask Priscilla, how can procurement processes be expedited and at the same time promote environmental and social standards compliance? Priscilla? Gladys, thank you very much for the question. Just to start on answering this question, I think I would like to echo what Enzo, Jack, and Shirley have said, that for me, the most important is that we need to ensure that our framework, our procedures have the adequate flexibility and adjust to the specific context of where we are operating. And on saying that, I would like to say particularly in the case of IFAT, it's like procurement has been designed to align our procurement function to IFAT's mandate which is to help the rural authorities and communities to overcome poverty and hunger in a sustainable manner. So in IFAT projects, 
had a it hard development objectives that will target a specific environmental and social considerations. This um, by saying that to highlight like last year, if it has revamped its all project procurement framework to ensure actually that to support the speed up and the rapid response and the project implementation, but moving from one size fits all, where our projects needed to fit one fit set of procedures that were very stringent at many times and that was impeding the speedy project delivery rate to a fit for purpose procurement solution that upholds international practices, procurement principles, but the most important that is adequate tailored to the political, economic, and social context of the country. And I would like to say also here that one of IFAT's um, strength and support of sustainability is that IFAT as an organization, as an IFI, works through national systems in support of procurement and support of project implementation. And by doing that, it aims at supporting economic and social development. By just going a specific into the question of how on um, practical terms we're doing that, I would just like to mention maybe a couple of cases. We have a recent case on, on climate resilience in the Latin American region and part of Asia, where IFAD actually is supporting the introduction of neglected and underutilized type of seeds in Bolivia, as I mentioned, Peru and India. So these type of seeds are generally underused and they have done under research, but they're more resilient against the effects of climate change. And therefore, we, could, we worked together with the project team at that time, and we considered that the right procurement strategy, the right procurement approach needs to be embedded at the moment the design of the project was considered. So in this case, we, for, we tailored the procurement arrangements to suit the procurement objective, provided extensive market research, work with the market in order to ensure that the farmers could have access to this type of seeds. Therefore, we were guaranteeing also the promotion and the use of seeds for environmental preservation and preservation also of indigenous knowledge that has been acquired at a specific region. And what we did in terms of the procurement strategy, besides the market research, we also involved community participation, we worked with suppliers, and included, for example, restricted um, specifications in order to promote uh, the market for such a seed. So we are therefore empowering the local communities and building a market for this and use uh, grains while at the same time contributing to climate resilient agriculture for fighting food and nutrition insecurity in the context of, of climate change. And another example also that I would like to mention on how procurement contributes to the sustainability and to the objectives of the organization is, for example, we have a case in, of livestock and rangeland um, resilient program in Sudan, where the pastors in Sudan suffer from an overuse and degradation after the independence as grazing areas in South, in South Sudan became more unavailable. So in this case, for example, the objective of the procurement was to establish and create knowledge in these communities for the water well and distribution mechanism of water resources. And for this, we adopted actually a community-driven approach to procurement, meaning that the communities were trained in procurement, carried out the procurement themselves, and they were supervised by the project management unit. And the communities in this case, for example, contribute to 8.5 to 10% of the total cost of investment in cash and their participation in procurement and solicitation of bid and evaluation promotes transparency in the process and also the much needed sets of belonging that we need to ensure the communities have in order to move forward the project in a sustainable manner. So with these measures, we are supporting the empowerment of the communities as enhance the suitability of the solutions introduce and ensure that the impact actually is sustainable as the communities can operate and maintain the equipment and work themselves. And something also that I would like to highlight is that it's very important that the procurement framework and the procurement process and procedures include and address social and economical consideration. And on this, I would like to remark that it has, has done a, an embark on an amazing journey and has done amazing work on integrating recently procurement with environmental, social safeguards consideration. By doing this, we are ensuring that the projects and the procurement include addresses all the risks that are needed and any contractual or responsibility and obligation are cascaded down uh, to the suppliers. Thank you, Flat. Thank you so much, Priscilla. I um, really appreciate that you gave us so many case studies, so many examples of uh, real life uh, field projects that um, IFAT is working on. And uh, thank you so much also for reminding us that uh, it's not only about agility and efficiency and making sure that we are creating the space for innovation. Most importantly, we need to keep aligned to our organization's mission and uh, making sure that we are still addressing the needs of our, um, of our beneficiaries. So thank you so much for that. And thank you so much also for sharing the new uh, ESSS compliance by IFAD. 
So uh, I would like now to ask um, Jeff to, um, to share some experiences from ADB. ADB is uh, one of the leading organizations in procurement practices. And so I would like to ask Jeff, which are the main challenges that you would say the ADB has faced? And what are the lessons learned from your experience? Jeff? Thank you very much, Gladys, um, and, and everyone who's been before me. And I'm going to echo some of my um, colleagues and friends' comments here. Um, two facets have to be in place. Um, the first is an enabling environment and policy within the lender, within ADB. Uh, and the second is the same as, as Jack and Shirley and others have pointed out, within the borrowing country. The two have to align otherwise there's going to be a mismatch we may allow it they won't permit it it's not going to happen um, and it's also you need to separate out the agility in policy which is a principles-based one versus the agility in a transaction um, which you know, multi-stage bidding certainly for, for large infrastructure is one way of introducing agility into the transaction um, but really to apply principles-based and agile processes it needs a, the reasoned application of professional judgment. Um, and that takes a very significant skill set on the part of the procurement practitioner, on the part of the auditor who's going to turn up and check on what they're going to do. Uh, and it is actually, if you look at the big infrastructure that we finance, uh, normally hundreds of millions of dollars and sometimes over that, um, there is a risk, a, a sensible risk aversion the taking risk on huge infrastructure investment. So trying to introduce innovation into a $500 million water treatment plant when there's proven technology is difficult. So you need to look around the margins. Um, one of the ways to do that is, for example, the use of weighted merit point criteria on environmental considerations. Um, you know, Jack and I are working on a power station somewhere that we won't name, but we have zero liquid discharge uh, which means the power station takes up no water from the environment other than the startup um, water for its cooling system. So it doesn't place demands on the river irrigation systems and water tape. Um, uh, another would be a voltage network. Okay, it costs 150% of a regular transmission network. Um, for 25 years, the life cycle costs and therefore the energy efficiency improves. Um, convince the borrower to pay that 50% more up front. You really do have to be in the procurement discussion during the design of the project and looking at these issues when the project is at basically pre-feasibility stage. Coming and looking at a bidding document, really mid-project, is, is way too late. But it's also about the art of the approach. Uh, you're going to learn to drive one day. There's no way I'm in a Ferrari. Uh, they don't know this, but the 15-year-old the Ford in the basement is what they'll be learning on. And it will be their first car if I can keep it running for another four or five years. It's about the art of the appropriate. I mean, to give an example, I had one borrower wanting to use for a six-kilometer tunnel, e-reverse auction for a design-build six-kilometer tunnel that's not an innovation, that's a bad idea. Um, and, but with a principles-based policy, it takes quite a long time to say no, because you have to justify it. So when you go along this journey, you really do have to make sure that your staff resources, that your borrower's resources are procurement savvy and smart and at a high level. Because as I said earlier, it's the reasoned application of professional judgment uh, in agile as to what is fair, what is right, what can be justified within the procurement transaction. That's a little just saying it's allowed or no, that's not permitted. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 34, 35 years now. I remember agile being about the New York garment industry. Then it was about the car industry. Um, and then it was about the IT industry. And now it's about the IFIs and the MDBs and entire procurement environments. The drivers are good and they're valid. And it's interesting to see how it's grown. But it's not easy to do. In some ways, it's harder than the compliance-based systems that we have 
where you have a lowest number, that's an absolute, and every public servant is very happy with that absolute. Um, but it's, it's, it's a paradigm shift in thinking about procurement, thinking about true value for money, and how do I achieve that iteratively through multiple processes, or if that's the appropriate. You don't always need Agile, um, but having it in the toolbox is very important because in critical areas and strategic areas, it can add significant value. And that's over for me, Gladys. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, my, my congratulations for being successful at making us laugh while you were explaining the ex extremely complicated, complex uh, concepts on, uh, on procurement. The, the example of the Ferrari was, uh, was fascinating you know, and also very, very timely. Um, with that, I would like to go to Aisha on uh, scaling up. Aisha, my Swedish is terrible, so I um, would like to, for the benefit of our audience, to say that Aisha um, works for a law firm, Runeland Law Firm, and uh, she will be talking to us about the scaling up. So Aisha, which successful programs, strategies, and knowledge can be shared across the network of the multilateral development banks to deliver larger results uh, for project procurement through innovation. Thank you, Gladys. I, I think my colleagues have uh, shared with us many specific programs and I, and I will share another, um, but just listening to everybody and drawing on some of my own background and experience, I think it's it's nice to, to take a step back and look at some of the key principles that might be emerging from this conversation of what focuses on making something uh, possible and sustainable during full sca scaling up and rolling out some of these innovations. What I would say is that for scaling up uh, to be successful and sustainable and for innovation to produce long-term benefits, that collaboration and education are not only important, but they're really quite imperative. Because as we heard from everybody, from Jack and Jeff and Priscilla and Shirley and Enzo uh, in the first beginning, this is, um, you're trying to achieve particular solutions to preset problems. And you have many stakeholders around the table. Jeff just said, um, much more eloquently than I can ever say, they must be, they must be aligned. The, the bank has to be aligned with the borrower or else nothing is going to work. So everybody has to be on the same page and everybody has to understand what is trying to be done. So to develop operational solutions in a sustainable manner, I think one of the first steps is that the procurement system itself has to be designed with achieving that in mind. And what does that mean? Um, it means you have to have an objective framework while allowing for that subjective implementation to gain that flexibility. So said in another way, you, you have to have the right tools in the toolbox, but during implementation, you have to have a workforce that is thinking and capable of understanding those tools and deploying those tools in possibly innovative means. So while you'll have a, a finite set of tools, you'll have an infinite set of possibilities on how to use those tools once you understand the art of the possible and the art of the appropriate, as Jeff had said. And secondly, for scaling up and, su and sustainability to be achieved, you have to have buy-in on so many levels and you have to consider how what that means, who's around your table, and how you are going to engage them from an early start. So it, the system has to, the procurement system has to be designed to allow for engagement and to allow for understanding and to allow for the views of various constituents to be taken in and adopted as appropriate at the right time. Now, that's in the early designing phase. Now, during the phase where issues are 
identified and problems are defined, the system has to allow for the user's voices to be heard. Uh, because it's really good and fine to design a system to solve a solution with a technology, but it needs to be addressing a problem on the ground. And during the, the, the design of the system, it ha you have to be able to then look at your tools and tailor them in creative ways. And I have one minute left. So I want to go to my solution uh, or my specific uh, program that I promised. And that is the, the World Bank program for the prevention of gender-based violence on uh, bank financed infrastructure projects. I had the privilege of being a part of this uh, included in studying the problem, studying the problem, uh, a World Bank task force that was launched in 2016 for specific issues that surfaced in Uganda with gender-based violence on bank finance projects. So clearly that phase engaged uh, the, uh, the society at large, civil society engaged the users, engaged bank personnel and engaged the industry on looking at defining the problem well, and then worked very closely with the procurement function to define using standard tools in innovative ways um, to, and we can talk about this, but the deployment ultimately the solution was a way to hold all partners accountable, um, including the contractors and having a mechanism using dispute board, dispute review boards and arbitration to have a, a mechanism that you can roll out and make it sustain the reality of uh, prevention of gender-based violence um, sustainable. So that, sorry for taking a, a few seconds over, but thank you, back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, just would like to to highlight, and, and these are Jeff's words, so please allow me to borrow them. But um, I think that when you started your your contribution talking about connection and education, it goes back to having savvy and smart um, procurement officers. But I think that your emphasis on uh, making sure that we're getting the buy-in is not only it doesn't apply only to procurement, but to the whole project cycle of innovation, making sure that we are user centric and are obtaining the buy in from all the different stakeholders. Thank you so much also for sharing the, the links, John, to those specific solutions that Aisha was talking about um, of her contribution through the World Bank projects. I would like now to shift our attention to the audience. We have lots of questions and I would like to congratulate our uh, OPR division, uh, Thomas and, and Priscilla specifically, because they have done a great job making sure that we are targeting procurement specialists today. So uh, uh, the great majority of, uh, of our audience today are practitioners and that's why we have so much engagement from the audience. We won't be able to get to all the questions, but now that we have back Enzo, Thomas and Dina, uh, I see that the most voted question is coming from Walid. He's asking, today that we have ADB, EBRD, IFAD, and the World Bank together around the table, any update on the latest efforts to harmonize MDB's procurement frameworks? And so um, you mentioned that you want, you want to answer this question. Thank you very much. I, I think my colleagues could answer just as well. But just to say that, uh, first of all, the MDB as a procurement group goes back a long time, right? We have been working together for many years. That's why we are such close friends also, uh, but uh, also we meet bi-weekly. So the pandemic had some positive impact on our ability to meet because we switched to a mode that allows us to meet. Every two weeks we meet and we discuss pretty much every emerging issue, but we have made significant progress in harmonizing around principles and key themes, right? We, we don't necessarily look at harmonizing every line of our documents, which is not possible because there's some different policy you know, drivers, but we are definitely harmonized on everything that we discussed today, for example, on the approach uh, uh, to integrating environmental and social consideration into the procurement process, so the cascade to contract, so that we're totally uh, harmonized. We harmonize for now on how we, um, about the approach to the market, on how we engage with the market. So there are a whole range of issues uh, where we made significant approach and some, even some very specific uh, 
uh, you know, type of, of, uh, um, of mechanism, like for example, approach to abnormally low tenders and so forth. But the important thing is that we discuss emerging risks. We try to be on the same page on how to give an answer to the market or to the clients. We discuss even at the project level. And the most important thing, one of the most important thing, we are completely harmonized on how we assess procurement systems. We have together uh, driven the development of the uh, what's called the MAPS, the, the, the uh, methodology to assess procurement system, which is the universal tool used not only by developing countries, but also by OECD countries to identify areas of strengths and weaknesses in procurement systems and therefore help design tailor reforms to uh, improve the system. So I think we're making great progress. There's still uh, you know, room to make more, but we are basically talking now all the time. And that's the, that's the objective, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and so I see Jeff's hand is up. Yeah, and just one more thing to add. Um, EBRD, World Bank, and ADB, um, and this is the only policy area in which we do it, have mutual reliance arrangements, which means we would entrust, um, ADB would entrust World Bank with 100% of the procurement oversight or EBRD and vice versa. So to that extent, we're not harmonized. We can accept, we can swap in our policy for World Bank's for EBRDs in our operations. Over. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, actually, there is one question for uh, Ion now, for, uh, for Jack. So um, the question is, chief among which is how, how to useful innovations, okay, which is how to useful innovations get implemented when donor and country stipulated rules mandate, how the process should be carried out. I think it has to do with uh, this, uh, I think it was uh, Jon that contributed this, how, how to operate when the legal framework does not allow you to, uh, to uh, be quite innovative. So uh, Jack, would you like to address this question from Franklin? Yeah, um, uh, I have to admit, I'm not exactly sure what exactly the, the sort of the, how the question is, is put, but uh, I, I think I will combine that with uh, a couple of questions which was related to multi-stage procurement. Yeah? And I, I'd like to go, to go back on that issue to what I was saying before that, uh, you know, in order to have an enabling environment for procuring uh, innovation, you, you need to have a, a partnership approach. And the partnership approach, Asha was also talking about that, you know, that the, the point is that you need to work together from the beginning, even maybe development stage, you know, planning, development, uh, procurement, which becomes a part of that, and implementation. And it's a partnership approach, the whole uh, process. And I think that Without that partnership approach, uh, you probably will not be able to achieve uh, fully the sort of objective of full uh, uh, innovation. No? And that creates in itself then a, a number of issues. So I'm not going to go through each and every one of those, but from procurement point of view, uh, it, it's what I refer to as sort of multi-stage uh, procurement. Now, all of us as banks, we have the two, stand, two stage uh, tender uh, procurement documents, you know, which to me is a sort of a, a very good basis for, for multi-stage, but you can, you can develop that. And we have all uh, have procurement policies that allows you to build in more stages in, the, in this uh, uh, process, you know. And that's really what we're trying to, to, to do in EBID. We actually have uh, since our policy, which we did in 2014, uh, we have actually said, you as a client must apply for the large complex blah, 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 uh, uh, procurement, uh, you must apply a two stage or multi stage tendering approach, unless we agree that there are justifications why not to do it. So in rather than in saying that uh, you do a traditional procurement, we actually say, no, you do untraditional procurement first. And only if you uh, uh, believe or there are good justifications, you do it traditional, single stage, et cetera. You know. It's a way of, of let's say, seeing the same issue in, in a different way. And frankly speaking, we are not trying to promote this only for complex projects or, or let's say where we believe that there needs to be innovation in the solution, but also for other products where at the end of the day, um, uh, we see too much of the prescriptive approach and want to see the more, uh, let's say, functionality in 
in the in the approach, which can go from simple things like we we think is a simple thing buying a bus. But frankly speaking, we have so many problems with the buying buses that we know can be avoided through a multi-stage process. So that's a little bit sort of, of the thinking behind that. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Gladys, may, may I add something very quickly, just because I saw a question on competitive dialogue. Just to say, I agree with everything Jack said, but competitive dialogue is a form of multi-stage uh, tenor, but, but it is a, the, sort of the most extreme uh, and, and yeah. useful to drive innovation absolutely when the mark you want to ask the market right you don't you want to give simple functional specification and ask the market how are you going to do it and that's very iterative it goes through commercial financial legal um aspects separately there are separate uh, parallel conversations observed by a property advisor so it's a very complex one uh, anyway uh just to say there are different ways to approach i agree with jack but you know competitive dialogue because i saw the question i want to say it's a very particular one and and with the Proportionality in mind can be used only, should be used only for very, very complex project where you want to drive innovation in the market from, from scratch. Thank you, Enzo. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have loads of questions. I'm going, I'm going to ask our, our uh, speakers to maybe help us after this event to make sure that we address those questions with the audience anyway. And uh, we will be sharing the event proceedings on IFAT's event page. So uh, John will be sharing that link again with you on the chat. Let me just address one question that I think is, is quite relevant here. Uh, we don't have much time left to address it. So I ask whoever is ready for this one. It's, it comes from Dries. How to improve efficiently the local content on uh, development finance institutions funded projects and use those projects as an enabler for industrialization? Who would like to take that question very, very quickly? Jeff? And please, uh, anyone add or, or supplement this. I mean, I, I've had a look at this um, in a couple of our borrowing member countries. Uh, and for the larger ones, it actually makes no difference. Um, most of the content or the vast majority of the content is being generated locally. Um, but for the smaller, smaller states and fragile states and conflict affected states, it does come into play and we are actually looking at not preferencing or reserving local content, bearing in mind we are all multilateral institutions and aim the same du duties at all of our shareholders, but looking at ways we can develop um, local capacity in contract packaging in the types of investment that we're making. Um, that will align itself to small and medium sized enterprises, which are very important drivers of economic growth and development. But the answer is not really in protectionism or reserving domestic content. We do have a, a mechanism for it, um, which I think we share with you, Enzo. Um, but we can't, we, we don't commonly see it in use. So really, if, if it's, it's not a procurement question. It's an, op it's an operational priority to develop domestic capacity, and it should be a lending decision, not, a, not in the procurement transaction as such. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, with that, hold on, let me, let me go back to, to you guys. Um, with that, Jeff, I would like now to uh, give the floor to uh, Tina Salesh. She is the regional director uh, for IFAT for the Near East, North Africa, and Europe division. Dina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gladys, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, let me just begin by first saying I'm really pleased to be joining you all on such an exciting topic. Uh, I have to deliver the closing remarks, and I really hope to do justice to the rich messages from a group of extremely experienced procurement professionals. Um, I'm also happy to see such, uh, or to witness so many people attending, some of whom I recognize myself. So hello to everyone. And um, begin also by thanking all our panelists for these excellent inputs, your reflections, and also for sharing the success stories from your organizations. Uh, but also the challenges that we encounter with innovations in procurement. I think we can all take new impulses and insights away from this session. And what stood out to me is how important it is to think about innovations, not only in terms of you know, our projects and our designs, but also in terms of you know, the implementation through the procurement stages and how to achieve 
the impact and transformation in the markets that we work in. Um, we all know and we've heard uh, procurement touches all spheres of life, um, you know, different uh, sectors, as, as I think it was Jeff who said, you know, let's, or Jack who said, let's think about it in terms of our financing and our development approaches. Uh, but I also would like to quote Jeff who said, procurement is about the reasonable application of professional judgment. And this needs a good procurement strategy that is developed holistically and as part of the full process of a procurement transaction. We also heard agility in policy is different from agility in transactions. And a takeaway I took from Enzo's remarks was that, you know, we need to be flexible yet systematic and evidence-based approach to procurement is needed. And I think this is fundamental as we also heard from the other speakers. It's about engaging the stakeholders, about looking and knowing what your context is all about. It's also about you know, capturing the needs and realizing with innovation, there are also trade-offs. So I'd like to also talk about the, you know, we heard a lot about markets and we heard um, about you know, how do you work and how do you generate uh, procurement interest. So let me say without market development, innovative approaches are doomed to fail. As bidders might not be ready to provide or accept the new technology or innovation, and the impact of course will be severely limited. We heard already from the speakers how key it is to ensure alignment with all stakeholders, communities, governments, development partners, and the private sector. Development banks are not spearheaders of procurement of innovation, but are good in innovation of procurement and to ensure that we can facilitate and lift the barriers to an enabling environment. I observe in our project that procurement officers are often not involved in the strategic planning phases of the projects, and therefore the value achieved by strategic procurement planning is very limited. We need creative and well-trained, experienced resources, which should use the strategic value that procurement offers to maximize our impact, not only in terms of innovations, but also in terms of social and environmental standards. As we work mostly through national procurement systems at EFAD, these innovations and standards become relevant for local markets and therefore have a lasting impact. Project life cycles are not static, and we all know that. Situations evolve, shocks may occur as we witnessed recently with COVID and the disruption to supply chains and regional international trade corridors. Last year alone, new methods were introduced like innovative partnerships and competitive dialogue. But we realized that even with such methods, flexibility is challenging. Priscilla said, not one size fits all. And that's an important consideration when we attempt to be fit for purpose. As Shirley said, the non-traditional procurement approaches can open up a world of solutions. Oftentimes, requirements are based on the narrow knowledge of the buyers. So again, crowdsourcing helps spot a wider range of solutions. No traditional procurement method enables large-scale innovation tools or scalable innovations, but also empowering communities enhances the suitability of solutions and ensures sustainability. So flexibility is key. And we're hearing that agility, flexibility keeps coming up all the time. So to conclude overall, we made great progress in the reform of project procurement at IFAD. You heard from Thomas in the beginning, he, IFAD reworked everything from policy to implementation as part of his journey to meet all international standards and remain fit for purpose. We aligned our procurement function to IFAD's mandate, but also not losing sight of being able to respond rapidly and adapting to the local context. These discussions show that still much can be achieved by harnessing the strategic value of procurement in transforming local markets. And to this end, I'm very happy that IFAD is rolling our large scale capacity building programs with Build Proc for procurement and sustain for safeguards that are open to all IFIs working in agriculture and rural development. So with that, um, I thank you all for your participation 
and um, really a pleasure. Back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, before we close today's event, I would like to invite you to our next IFAT innovation talk, when we will be focusing on the role of the public sector in the assimilation process of innovative agro-technologies. That event will be run in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Israel, and uh, we are looking forward to welcoming you to that innovation talk. Um, so now I would like to thank all of our speakers and our fantastic team at CDI, John Lichel, thank Carmela Lopez for their fantastic work today. And I would like to be very, show my, my gratitude to, the, to OPR, my colleagues, uh, Priscilla Torres and Thomas Erickson uh, for uh, making today's event possible. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you to uh, our audience for your great participation, all the questions, and we'll make sure to get back to you with the answers to all those that we were not able to address today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye and see you next.